Good evening, everyone. I'm Michelle Leifer. I'm the director of the USDAN Institute for Animal Health Education at the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center. On behalf of my colleague, Kimberly Young, I'd like to thank you all for joining us for tonight's event, Emergencies in Exotic Pets with Dr. Latoya Latney. Tonight's event will be recorded and we'll send out a link tomorrow in case you miss anything or would like to share it with a friend. Uh, Dr. Latney has a fantastic presentation planned covering a wide range of topics. So we ask that you please save your questions until the end of her presentation and we'll be taking questions via the chat box and promise to get to as many as possible. Um, I'd like to take a moment to let everyone know about an upcoming event on Thursday, November 10th at 6 p.m. Dr. Alexandra Vandervoort, head of AMC's ophthalmology service, will join us to discuss vision loss in dogs and cats. For more information on our upcoming events and to register, please visit our website, www.amcny.org slash events. It's now my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Dr. Latoya Latney is a senior veterinarian specialist in zoo and reptile medicine in AMC's avian and exotic pet service. She's a progressive patient advocate who brings a contagious enthusiasm for celebrating the physiology, anatomy, and medicine of exotic and zoo animals. Dr. Latney is a board member of the Association of Reptile and Amphibian Veterinarians and has authored numerous medical journals, written several book chapters, and has been awarded a series of grants for her research work. We are so grateful to have her with us to lead tonight's event. I know that she's incredibly busy and we appreciate your time. Um, so please welcome Dr. Latoya Latney. Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. Show of hands, good stuff. All right, um, I'm gonna start. Um, I'm so excited. This talk, for those of you who've been to a couple of my talks in the past, the enrichment one or the pain one, um, the links are still freely available. I try really hard to stay pretty funny and colloquial, especially when it comes to like really scary topics. So uh, this will be a bit entertaining. Um, and I did want to mention that unlike the other talks, we will be talking about some of the species I didn't get a chance to talk about as much before. That includes um, wildlife, uh, pain scales for some of the other animals. So we kind of have an idea of, of what pain looks like and discomfort looks like. Um, and then also we're gonna include inverts because they matter. We're definitely gonna talk about fish um, as well. So with that having been said, uh, the way that this lecture is outlined is to go over some of the major um, emergencies. Um, and specifically, we're gonna talk about what these emergencies are for all species. Each um, time we go through the major topics, um, you may hear me give a caveat about what's different between a mammal versus a reptile versus a bird versus a fish and why certain things may seem more urgent to them um, and depending on the category that we're discussing. Then ultimately we're gonna go through each species profile to let you know what pain looks like in them um, and what their most common emergencies are. Um, and then last but not least, we're gonna talk about some very, very basic first aid. Um, it's gonna be very basic, not because we don't feel that we don't wanna empower you guys, but sometimes their anatomy is so fragile and frail and because as you'll see, there's a number of different emergencies um, that these guys can have. We wanna set you up for success. We really wanna make sure you're helping and not harming your animal while you're in the process of seeking veterinary care. Um, and so without further ado, we shall start with uh, the first overview, and that's of categories of emergencies. Try to make it super simple, ABCs. Um, so airway emergencies, bleeding emergencies, and then the C stands for neurologic. Those are gonna be situations where there's um, very little you can do at home. You really, if you're having one of these emergencies, absolutely need to seek veterinary care. Um, there are some things you can do to minimize the stress of the animal and to try to minimize the um, impact of the emergency, but these are hardcore qualifiers. Yeah, no, there's some equipment at the veterinary hospital um, that can handle this better than what we can DIY at home. Um, then we have trauma, toxicities, and organ-specific disease. So if you can think of it, ABCs, TTO, okay? Um, trauma, unfortunately, invades all of these categories, um, but toxicities, happens to be, I would say, one of the more unique things um, that 
I want to say in general is a huge list. There's an entire board certification for this category for all species. So it's really intense. But because we have, you know, loving, adoring um, pet um, exotic species, non domestic animals, and then of course, those of us who are um, in the business of trying to help our friends without a credit card that is wildlife, um, we're dealing with the diversity of the animal kingdom. Um, and so we have a diverse number of things that they can be exposed to. It makes this category so much more important to us to really be able to hone in on the specifics of what's dangerous um, to these animals versus not. And then organ specific disease. And these things are going to be more tailored towards um, your particular pet species. So when we start talking about ferrets, we'll talk about the very specific things in this category that they're like kind of known for. Um, so we're gonna go through all of those things. We're gonna start with airway emergencies. Um, there's three major causes for airway emergencies. Uh, the first is trauma. Um, so if there's been a concussive hit to the body, if there's been anything inhaled or anything um, traumatic, a hit to the neck, um, God forbid something's punctured, um, you know, the body wall in any way, um, that's, we just qualify all of those things of trauma. Again, we need to get these animals to an emergency room stat. Then we have blocking the airway. And what's really important to remember amongst the different species is that we have some animals that were designed for air. So we have our avian friends, right? Um, these guys are awesome. Um, as much as I joke, I like to remind people they were reptiles and still have some reptile remnants hanging out in the background. But the essentially the difference between them, the ways that they've evolved differently, fantastic respiratory system. They really make us look like, like we took some steps back evolutionarily, the way that they've designed their body systems to handle air. They need it for buoyancy um, and the way they process it is very, very, very unique. And we'll get a little bit into that. Their red blood cells are way bigger than ours, can hold on to more oxygen. Um, this is true for some of our reptile friends too. When we take an inhale, we get all the oxygen down deep into our lungs. It goes into the bloodstream. The blood takes the oxygen to all of the cells. We're happy. When we exhale, we're trying to get the garbage stuff out, the CO2. These guys can actually take in as much oxygen into the bloodstream on inhalation and exhalation. They're amazing. They're like, even when I'm like exhaling, I'm still breathing. If you can think of it that way, it's pretty awesome. Reptiles do that too. Just putting that out there. Um, fish are laughing at us. Amphibians are laughing at us. They're like, we've got five ways to breathe, but this is the unique way that birds do. Um, so you can imagine they also have these, um, they almost look like bags connected to their respiratory system. So we have lungs, this massive tissue, it expands, it contracts. Um, birds actually have rigid fixed airways, which is really nice. They're like, we just need, you know, almost like freight train oxygen access all the time. And because they are so buoyant, because they can change altitudes, because they can like dive, um, they actually have extensions of their lungs that actually go into their abdominal cavity. We do not have a separation between the chest and the abdomen. So no diaphragm, they don't have time for that. They're like, why do you guys separate it? You can put air anywhere. Why haven't you figured this out? Um, but they have these extensions of their, their lungs. We call them air sacs. And they're basically like, they're like almost like Ziploc bags to hold air on tap, to have air on tap, <laughs> to be able that they can, can complete this respiratory cycle and never have to worry about inhale and exhale very quickly. Um, these air sacs actually invaginate some of the bones so like they're in the bone marrow, which allows for a very light skeleton, which means, hey, look, if I want to do 3G in the sky, I can do that. We can't do that. We wish we were that cool. Um, that having been said, anything blocking access of air into this beautiful complex system, huge emergency, okay? Um, usually in birds, it'll present as a, you'll hear wheezing, clicking. This is true for most animals, but in these guys, for some, I would arguably say it's the most terrifying species to see an airway emergency in because you know they're so well adapted. They've got air on tap. They've got lungs everywhere. And to see them struggle to breathe means we've bypassed all of their compensatory mechanisms. This is truly a scary um, thing and we have to address it quickly. Sometimes we inhale and get like seeds. You no, know, anyone swallowed something the wrong way. <laughs> we cough, we've got a whole mucociliary escalator that gets that stuff out, you know, 
they're not super strong in that category. Um, so trying to get stuff up is not something that a bird does easily. The airway gets really, really narrow before it blossoms, you know, to this rainbow of like lungs and air sacs. And so there's some choke points down there. Sometimes seeds can get aspirated, um, anything that can cause inflammation in the upper airway. So that's in the nose, which is really short in these guys. And then their trachea, so the windpipe. Anything that's causing an issue there is a problem. That's birds. Um, I want to say almost same situation for reptiles. Remember, they evolve from them. So they're like, yeah, we don't need that diaphragm business. Our tidal volume is going to be 10 times that of mammals. We don't know why you guys haven't air adapted yourselves. Hold more oxygen. Do more with what you got. <laughs> they're the energy conservationists on the planet, and they're really good. And that's why they outlive everything. Um, same thing. Reptiles almost have more compensatory mechanisms for dealing with air-starved situations. Um, to the point where they've been looked at as experimental models for hypoxemia. So like you're never winning a breath holding contest against a reptile, okay? 20 years later, <laughs> like it'll be on your tombstone that you lost, okay? Um, and they'll still be walking around looking like they're only, you know, two years old when they're 200. Ask any turtle you ever meet. Um, so anytime we see these guys choking, coughing, anything coming up, them having trouble breathing, an airway emergency in a, in a, in a reptile um, usually looks like in any species, the neck is outstretched. If we have arms, the arms are outstretched. <sighs> We're trying to get air in. Um, and sometimes, depending on the species you're dealing with, it may not be that they're breathing faster, but just that they're breathing deeper and more slowly because they're... <gasps> They're really trying to get the air in. So um, in that sense, I wanted to share that with you as well. Um, sometimes if there's anything flooding the lungs, um, blocking the airway. So if there's fluid in the lungs, if there's been, um, unfortunately, a blood, like a um, blood accumulation from a vessel rupture or from a concussive injury, um, if there's anything starting to pool in the lung tissue itself sometimes in the air sacs, sometimes things pushing on the air sacs, um, that can also present as a, unfortunately, as a blocking the airway scenario. Um, anything that then irritates, if we don't have it walled off, if anything is irritating the airway, we can sometimes just see the same level of panic in terms of air starveness, okay? Um, birds are HEPA filters, you know, OG style. They were here before we develop HEPA filters, we've used their technology to try to make it such that um, we can really purify our air, they will be able to pick up nanoparticle sizes of things that are aerosolized in the air. And if any of that stuff is irritating, it can present it as an emergency. Um, sometimes I tell people don't even burn candles if you have pet birds. It's not even about whether or not the wax is soy wax or not. It's the fumes. They're very, very, very sensitive. Um, we're going to get into some sources of things that can unfortunately cause birds to have a lot of trouble, things that are burned that then cause unfortunate, um, you know, tissue damaging, cell dying reactions in their lungs. And that's, we'll talk about Teflon toxicity in a bit. Um, but sometimes it's it's not um, the airway itself that's the problem. It's what's attached to the airway, and that's the heart, right? So sometimes we'll see airway emergencies when there's heart disease. Um, and unfortunately, the big one that is different for each species is infectious diseases. And when we talk about infectious diseases, I break them into four categories that are the main ones. Bacterial, sometimes that's something um, we can combat with antibiotics. Fungal. Um, fungal disease is scary. That can cause voice changes in parrots because it starts to cause granulomatous um, inflammation in their trachea. Um, viral. So unfortunately, we are in the era where we know viral disease can definitely impact our lung health. We're more dealing with that epidemic now um, as primates. And then parasites sometimes can get in there and cause. And there are some parasites that are evolved just to mess with an animal's airway. So um, then we can kind of fast track to bleeding emergencies. And I'll give you a second to read the cartoon. Again, this is the way I try to remember things. Um, when we think of blood, we have to remember there's kind of like four major components of it. There's the, the total volume of what's in blood, right? So we've got some red blood cells, we've got some white blood cells. We've got these things called platelets. They're responsible for like you know, Band-aid work. They're the caulk, essentially, when some something's ruptured and we need to seal off, you know, a hole. 
Um, and then we've got a, a bunch of things that run in the background to make sure that all of these things in a fluid component that is actual fluid, um, all of these things are the components of our blood. Um, so when there's a bleeding emergency, um, the thought process is for us is such that, you know, did a vessel break? Um, is a vessel fragile? Um, is there a loss of the red blood cells? Or is there a loss um, of the platelet factors? Is something eating, chewing, or are we losing our white red blood cells in our platelets? Okay. Um, if the vessel is super, super, super inflamed, sometimes we can see the vessels leak. Okay. Sometimes when the velocity turns up, we can see platelets get all kinds of crazy and have, as you can see, a platelet party. <laughs> so there's a lot of things that I'm telling you right now, WebMD is not going to be able to decipher for you when you're dealing with your pet's emergency. Um, the major times we see bleeding in animals is again, trauma. We said this, the TTO is going to continue to pop up through here outside. Um, something punctured me, hit me in some way, shape, or form somewhere on my body. Um, and then what's scarier than that's the stuff you can see for the most part, which is how, like, it's terrifying, but at least you can see it. So you know, something's happened. What's really terrifying is when there's bleeding on the inside. Um, and it might not be in a place where you're going to see blood come out. So that's very readily apparent to the, to the pet um, owner. And this is usually a rupture of a vessel or damage or disease to an organ system. My rabbit friends, I'm talking to you, okay? This is actually what scares us the most about liver lobe torsions. Because when the liver twists on itself and it's attached to some baller vessels, the largest ones in the body, okay? It starts to slowly bleed. And sometimes that bleeding, um, can be the make or break as to whether or not we can actually have a surgical success at removing um, the part of the liver that twisted on itself, okay? And sometimes you won't see blood coming out of anywhere. It's welling up inside of the abdomen. Um, and so then we start to see up, oh, the blood carrying capacity starting to drop. All of a sudden now we see animals look like they're in pain and sometimes look like an airway emergency. Um, now that we don't have our oxygen carrying capacity. Um, the last thing I tell people to remember is we do see bleeding emergencies when there's a loss of the ability to clot. Um, this is supposed to be designed as a protective mechanism, okay? The, the organs that are really important for making sure the platelet party can go down as, as, as expected and not cause a problem, but deal with a problem, the liver's really responsible for sending signals to organize these guys to make sure they stay in their lane or else they get really hyper excitable and cause problems rather than fix them. Um, and then obviously the organs that actually make the platelets. So um, anytime we see liver disease or something that could compromise the liver, or we see any types of sometimes it's medications that can compromise an animal's ability to clot. Um, those are reasons um, for, for what we consider to be bleeding emergencies. Then we go to CNS. Um, the C stands for central, the N stands for nervous, the S stands for system. So central nervous system. I'm just putting neurologic in parentheses just to jog everyone's memories. Um, again, trauma. It's gonna be, I almost wanna do follow the bouncing ball. We're in Manhattan. We see a lot of animals. We see a lot of trauma. We're an IVEX, you know, accredited facility. Um, it's just the nature of we're in a dense, dense city. Um, a lot of people, a lot of animals, a lot of accidents can happen. Trauma, hands down, is pretty high on our list. So when we talk about um, a CNS injury, so that means brain and spine. Um, it also means peripheral nerves, but usually the ones that are like, we need to go to the hospital fast is if the brain took a hit or if the brain is injured or if the spinal cord is injured, just like in people. Um, our categories of trauma, again, are external versus internal, okay? External, did something hit me? Did I fall? Um, did something hit your pet? Did they fall? Um, did something strike my back? Um, was there an iatrogenic accident? Um, was there any type of blunt force trauma to those areas? Um, internal traumas um, are the things that sometimes pet owners are informed about after we evaluate them. Um, the internal traumas are, is there inflammation in the brain now secondary to a blood vessel rupture or secondary to the outside forces? Um, when the head is struck, we, you know, we talk about um, concussive forces. 
it goes from one side, hits one side of the skull to the other side. So there's a bouncing effect there. And the brain is very, um, you know, it's high tech, but it's pretty weak. It can't handle a loss of oxygen. It's really difficult for it to heal from injury and it will not tolerate not having glucose or like, a, you know, an energy source. Um, so this is why it looks, this cartoon for brain injuries there, like I would say almost of all of the organ systems that takes the longest to recover from an injury, like this one's on the slow, just like this one's on the slow path to recovery. Um, and I share this with you because if you do have a pet that either has an external or an internal injury um, that's brain related or even spine sometimes, but usually brain, this is why when we say, hey, look, they're going to be in the hospital for some time, or we have to be patient, or we have to be on seizure watch for three months out. And people are looking at me like, are you serious? And I'm like, yeah, it, it really does take a long time for neurons to heal. Um, so we do unfortunately see thromboembolic events. That's what that TBE means. Thrombo means clot, embolic means it formed. Um, events either we blocked the vessel or we ruptured one. And that's what the second cartoon is in this slide. Um, so traumatic, I would say, on a scale from one to 10 for most species that we're seeing on any given day, and we see a number of different species here at AMC, um, at least in our department, it's uncommon for us not to have at least one or two of these patients a day, if not through directly our service coming in through our emergency department to then be transferred to our service. Um, then we have things that are toxic to the brain and the spinal cord and the nerves of the body. And those qualify as an emergency as well. And it's not that other things can't cause CNS injury. These are the things that we see most commonly um, as people who have to triage emergencies. So medications will do it. I kid you not, I was literally running upstairs after having dealt with a patient that I was fearful may have been exposed to a medication um, that could be causing toxicity in their pet right now. Um, and it wasn't until we kind of got to a point in the conversation where I was like, oh no, did he reach into, he could have. And I'm like, ah. Oh. So um, any of our over-the-counter medications sometimes if, if animals get into it, um, definitely could be a cause for CNS toxicity. Plants, their foods, heavy metals, bacterial toxins. Um, sometimes when the liver is failing, it will release toxins that can also cause CNS disease. Um, so toxics, another major category um, for CNS. And then last but not least, we have primary neurologic disease. So if there's a disorder that's unfortunately starting to develop, or if there's a primary uh, disease um, that is occurring, um, we do have some animals that have primary epilepsy. We do have some animals that have seizures. Unfortunately, we have animals we know as they get older and in age start to develop um, a demyelinating syndrome with their lower spine. So they start to have trouble, you know, using their back legs. Um, so those are some of the major things in exotics. And I think only ones, and we'll go through those cases in species specific profiles. So we can hone in just on the pets that you have and which ones are important to look out for that for. Um, and then last but not least, if you've not followed the bouncing ball, liver <laughs> disease or failure. So I like to tell people like, in my opinion, um, the most important organ in the body is probably the kidney. Um, it controls a lot. <laughs> it controls a lot of what, um, what is needed to control other organs to make sure they're okay. The runner up to that hands down is the liver. Um, anything that's controlling our blood um, flow, telling the heart what to do and processing everything that we put in and out of our bodies and expelling things we don't need to have in our bodies anymore, extracting glucose from our systems to make sure everybody's um, at attention and, and doing the most. Uh, the liver's reach is far. Um, and when it's sick, there's not too, there aren't too many other systems that it cannot affect if it's not doing well. Um, so um, if you have to remember any themes, um, and this becomes really important because uh, this integrates why sometimes a clinician asks to do a test. Like, I really want to see the liver values. You're like, but my bird had a seizure. Why do you care about the liver? Like, these are part of the reasons why there's these interconnected um, relationships with regards to how different organ systems function and why it might not seem really evident to you. But when we're like, we need a global picture, we need to make sure the organ panel is okay. This is part of the reasons why um, we ask you guys to, you know, entrust with us um, 
to trust your animals, care to us to be able to really dig deeply to figure out why they have the emergency that they have so that we can really, really expedite addressing it um, with the best of care. So now we're going to get into toxicities. I know apparently America's favorite holiday is only a couple weeks away, so we'll get into it. Um, heavy metals. Um, we went through that list. Whew, we've got a lot to think about. Um, so copper and mercury are definitely heavy metals. Sometimes we, we find ourselves dealing with um, in exotics. Uh, I'd say more, more so in the sense that they've been contaminants in certain recreational things we might be used to using. So if you can think of creams, um, I hate to say it, I love the commercials. I'm not trying to put anybody out there, but like the copper creams or the copper socks and things like that, compression, all of those things, animals accidentally chew on it, nibble on it and absorb a dose that's inappropriate or ingest some of that. We could, we could find ourselves in a copper toxicity situation. Plant fertilizers, hands down, I'd say probably are, are like the bigger source, um, unless you have like burn creams and stuff like that you're working with. And then, um, one of the other things that we'll sometimes see mercury, even arsenic in um, from way, 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 way back in the day. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with a um, spring celebration called Holi. Um, it's a Hindu celebration of, we throw powdered color all over each other. We're celebrating the spring. I celebrate it every year. I, I chose not to show a picture of myself and my friend doused in, in Holi powders, um, but um, you know, what we do is we throw all these powders on and some they've been able to find um, in the past, uh, definitely they're, they're way safer now, but in the past they would find sometimes trace elements of arsenic, mercury, copper. I share this because like holy's like the, the best water bloom, but like made with color powder fight you're going to have, like everyone is smearing all of this. So inhalation could be a, an issue um, depending on region where you're at. It's really not as big of a concern now, but I um, wanted to put that out there. These are some of those places where these trace heavy um, metals can be found in things that might even be recreational. We might not even be aware of it. Um, then I would say we've got the big boys that are definitely in our houses, on our shelves, um, you know, attached to our appliances, you know, everywhere. Um, let's see here. All right, so zinc. I'm hoping at the end of this, maybe we'll do like a little infographic like we did before with like pain recognition. We did it with enrichment. So Absolutely. there was a coming your way. <laughs> it's going to be like, who's that? Like, like a huge book? I'm so sorry. I don't want to inundate everybody with information, but like I, it will really be helpful because when I go back through all of this stuff, I'm even like, I forgot there's this and that, there's this and that. So I tell people, you know, you know, screenshot it now, take a picture, save it in your phone, um, because this is the pictorial overview of where you're most likely going to find uh, zinc, okay? So definitely, believe it or not, um, indenture adhesives. So um, you'll find it in that batteries. I'm hoping no one's just running out here, but we got some birds that like to explore. We have some animals that like to chew on things or worst case scenario, if a battery falls into a tank or something like that, there's water corrosive exposure. Don't want that sunscreen for sure. And you might not think like, oh, why would my animal be like exposed to that if I have the sunscreen on my body? I don't know about you, but I'm very affectionate with my patients. And I have some birds that like to try to groom me. I have some rabbits that will kiss me right on the face. They'll, I have some animals I'll pet, even I have a mammal that's a dog. I know it's shocking, but like when like I'm scratching an area that's itchy for him, he'll lick another area on my body. Um, so sometimes if it's a topical exposure and it's enough of it and or if the animal accidentally, you know, tries to chew through a tube of, of SPF 50, okay? Makeup, uh, there's definitely some, um, especially for powders, um, zinc oxide powders also makeups that have SPF in it, and that's a protective thing for us. No question about that. Um, but when we're talking about smaller animals with high metabolisms, doesn't need it doesn't have to take a lot for it to have an impact. Um, things that you would see in terms of um, like caging supplies and things like that. Um, I'm hoping you can see here my little yeah. So this is um, galvanized steel. 
So we will see this sometimes on like duct work. Um, sometimes I, it was very rare for me to find a picture of even this bowl, but um, older um, caging, older um, cups for caging and things like that. It almost looks like a super shiny metal and almost like sometimes it has a powder residue on it. That's zinc that's coated another metal base. Um, and for a long time, we've kind of like, thank goodness, like the jig is up. Most people have stopped using like antique bird cages and things like that, galvanized steel for caging, but sometimes it's still lingering around. So I like to put that out there a lot of our, some of our kitchen appliances. So like mixing bowls, things that we want to have be super shiny all of the time. Um, sometimes those guys are galvanized. Sometimes there's a high zinc component to that. Um, Pennies. Um, so the year is not right on this, but uh, they were zinc coated up until I want to say the 80s, late late 90s. So um, this is I can't penguins all day every day. If I could just, it's almost like everyone that likes to flick those coins <laughs> into the water near the penguin exhibit. You have no idea what we have to do to the point where we can just wave a metal detector and know that these guys have swallowed all of the things that you've dumped in the water and having to scope these things out. Like, why? Just let it pass. No, no, let it pass. This thing will sit in there in a road and cause problems systemically in these animals if we don't get it out. Um, and then the other thing is kind of hard to see here. Um, this is a Wikipedia picture. Um, I'm notorious for it. Like I take my emergency C when I'm feeling, you know, under the weather, I have multivitamins that I take but you'll have some of those uh, multiple vitamins, especially uh, the ones that are triggered towards dealing with colds or a cold um, or flu symptom relief have zinc in them. And it's, it's advertised that it's with zinc. Um, there's even zinc gummies. So um, if your pet accidentally gets into that, um, understand that that's also a potential source. Then we're gonna get into uh, the belly of the beast. That is lead. <laughs> Lead, unfortunately, is in a number of things. When I had to sit down and go through, like, how could these animals still be exposed to lead? But so for some context, I was in Philadelphia for about 12 years. Um, you know, I've worked in Delaware and Jersey um, for, you know, consulting for zoos and things like that. And I just want to be very clear. There, there's a lot of ground um, level zinc. We're talking, you know, Civil War um, areas. And so some of the lead in the environment is historical. Um, here, there's different sources, and we'll kind of get into that, but in terms, environmental sources, but in terms of the commercial sources, unfortunately, um, lead beads for people who are like shooting ducks, what have you, or shooting any water, you know, any um, um, pets for hunting, um, caulk, I found sometimes can be um, lead heavy, um, so just make sure if you're going to Home Depot, like I do often, um, you want to make sure you're dealing with lead-free products if you're doing any home renovations um, or any patching up. Um, obviously, lead and, and zinc, unfortunately, this is, a, this is an antique bird cage picture, <laughs> but it also has significant meaning for, an, um, for zinc as well. You see very, very shiny caging. Just make sure it's not galvanized steel that you're dealing with, which is another term for zinc coated steel. Okay. Um, I found that lead can be um, present not only in stained glass, and I know this because we solder to make all of the glass pieces, you know, fit, um, it can also be in chandeliers. So that's a twofer up there in the, in the right hand corner. And then I found before, I want to say the late 90s, um, champagne foils used to be made with lead foils as opposed to aluminum, what they are now. So if you've got any, like, you know, you were saving the bubbly for a really long period. I don't drink champagne, so I don't know. But like, if you were saving it for a really long time, I know alcohol apparently gets better when it's older. Um, just make sure, you know, there's no animals getting into the stock of nibbling on the foils. Then we have... Um, Obviously, like acid lead batteries, um, probably not as much of an exposure unless you're a mechanic and you're dealing with some other things. Um, older linoleum tiles, so like things before the 70s, sometimes has lead in it. Obviously, lead sinkers, so what some people still use for fishing, unfortunately. And, and these things are not things of the past. I, I want to be clear about that. Some people still enjoy making lead sinkers for their fishing expeditions. I've had birds, unfortunately, I atrogenically challenged by that. Um, another thing that I found, and this has a picture of it being covered, but drapery weights. So if you have long curtains and you need to put weights 
keep everything down to the floor. I found a lot of them, the older style ones are made um, with lead because it's just a cheap, heavy product. And sometimes it'll give you the courtesy of covering it with fabric, um, but just be mindful of that. Um, of course, there's solder. So if you're doing any electrical work or anything like that, you're making circuit boards, things like that. If you're doing stained glass work, that's another place. And then really old ceramics. Uh, that's the other place that we tend to like, and we're talking really old. So any type of antique ceramics. Old paint, um, definitely a huge um, you know, situation because it's, it's really difficult to um, remove really, really old lead paint safely. So usually, um, especially for historic cities, like we happen to be in one, um, usually what we see is that um, uh, the lead paint has been painted over with something safer. We call that encapsulated. Um, we really care if the paint is flaking because that's when we're gonna have an exposure hazard. Um, in terms of when my house was built, you know, when it was painted, um, before the 1940s, there was an 80% chance that the paint on the walls had lead in it, okay? And I'm only sharing this because, like I said, from Philly, I lived in a historic house. <laughs> 1800s, no question, beautiful. I was like, it's gorgeous. But I had to make sure <laughs> I knew that there had been paint over paint over paint over paint because no one stripped that house down before I moved in for sure. Um, before the 70s, about 24% of the paints that were used um, had lead in them. And a significant amount that it could be a health risk if someone were to accidentally be exposed, ingested, or inhale it if it's, you know, if someone tries to strip it. Um, the places are obviously the walls, the baseboards, the flooring. And then the other major environmental source, again, groundwater versus old pipes. Now I have this circle up because again, Philly, Jersey, um, Delaware, a heavy rain, animals outdoors, there's lead in the water in the puddle outdoors. There's not a question in our mind. Uh, this sucks when you're dealing with zoos. At one point I had to chelate an entire zoo. That was intense. Um, but as we start to move up north here in, in the city, we get most of our water from the upstate aquifers, which is nice. That's great. We're like, and that water up there is super clean. It's super clean there. We got to make sure it doesn't hit any lead old pipes by the time it gets to us. Um, and so our city usually has a pretty good rep for, um, you know, monitoring lead levels in the water. Um, just again, the sourcing from where our, our, our water is, is from aquifers that are, you know, far away. So, um, but it, that goes without saying that there are some water exposure hazards sometimes that we will, I would say, more uncommonly see in, in even New York City proper. Food toxicities. I try really hard to keep this brief. We're getting through it. But uh, I want to say I might have to talk to the rat owner separately, <laughs> but the rest of the people on here are about to be livid. Okay. Chocolate, caffeine, coffee. CCC, um, was, was like, what is they cease and desist, okay? These things, very much, if those of you, show of hands, um, dog owners, I'm now that now. Um, this, exactly, exactly. So we already know, you know, you keep these away <laughs> from those animals. But um, the actual agent that causes problems um, is the um, methylxanthines and, and the theobromines. And this causes the heart to tack out, um, it can cause tremors, um, convulsions. It really does a number on a lot of the, I wanna say, keep the heart rate steady, keep the blood pressure um, autopiloted. Yeah, this, this agent works on those receptors. And so we tend to see um, almost a number of emergencies happening simultaneously if these animals ingest a toxic amount of it. Um, what's the toxic amount? That's what we call poison control for, because it varies depending on which species you are. But the general rule is you probably don't want to have them exposed to a lot of it as an exotic species um, because their metabolisms, again, depending on what species we're talking about, in general, way faster, way higher than ours. Um, and if not that, their GI transit time way slower sometimes. So when we're dealing with our herbivorous reptiles, like that is scary. When they eat something toxic, we're like, okay, rather than us being able to try to fix this immediately, we know we're going to be in it for a long term to try to reverse some of the, the medical problems that's being caused by the toxin. Um, 
I think one thing we tend to think of chocolate, coffee, and caffeine. I'm not a coffee drinker, um, but I am a tea fanatic. So uh, this gets me, I, I get in trouble with this too. Like if someone could put an IV of matcha into my vessels, like all day, every day, for those of you who know me, like I'm a, I'm a matcha tea addict. Um, I do love black teas as well. Yerba mate is like an espresso shot for me. That's how sensitive I am. But just remember if I accidentally drink some of your energy drink, you know, these are some of the other like lesser thought of sources of caffeine um, that your pet might be exposed to that you want to keep in the back of your mind. Uh, this might seem like it's hitting some pretty familiar notes in your brain. Uh, these would be things I'd be concerned about for cats and dogs as well. So onion toxicity, um, they have um, sulfur containing alkaloids. Um, what I'd like to share with you, I think most people like, yeah, onions and garlic's not great for, <laughs> for, for cats and dogs. Kind of have an idea of that. If you kind of have like a rule book for those companion species, I'd like to share with you the other um, things that you might have in your house that are similar in terms of things that they could be exposed to. Um, and again, I am guilty of this. I love, I love, I really love like forcing hyacinths to bloom in the in the spring. Like I'm that nerd that like has the bulbs in my refrigerator wrapped in the bag. I can't wait for the spring to start because like I love the smell of hyacinths, um, daffodils, crocus. Um, my family hardcore gardeners, so like I like those things. And then I think like oh shoot, <laughs> I do kind of go to you know I'm gonna say it's very it's very um common supermarkets sometimes will sell them in the plant aisle and you're like oh it's a little bright it's purple I'll bring it home let me bring it home you know and you're like it's not a lily so we should be fine <laughs> or at least that's what I would think as a cat owner um so just be mindful that these um bulbs are also in that family the whole garlic family as well um so these unfortunately like uh to really go after red blood cells break them down chew them up and then when we've got chewed up pieces of red blood cells floating through our body, the liver is like, all right, well, the liver and the kidney, and I want to say to a lesser extent, the lungs, they're the cleanup crew. Their job is to get things that are not supposed to be in your body out of your body. Okay. There's certain things the kidneys are going to take care of, but a lot of it's going to be, a lot of the onus is going to be on the liver and the liver starts to process this. It can't make everything that needs to go away, go away. This starts to filter through the kidneys and the kidneys, again, my favorite organ, they can't tolerate <laughs> a bunch of red blood cell byproducts coming through these very fragile tubes that are the reason why we're standing in a life, okay? Um, very sensitive, very dynamic organ, but um, this, this guy is a twofer. It'll hit both systems that are designed to get things out of your body. That's scary because it could damage the organs that are designed to get things away. Avocado, we're the only weird species on the planet. I'm saying this, okay? Human primates, I'm talking to you. <laughs> For some reason, we're okay with this. It's a superfood, that's great. For us, the rest of the world in animal kingdom, no, this is not okay. Blue lemurs don't like it either. The reason they don't is because, especially for Guatemalan um, sources, and depending on how ripe it is, um, there is an actual toxin. <laughs> that's why you'll see a bunch of animals in the wild eating it. They're not out here like, yeah guac like that's not their vibe <laughs> they leave it for us somehow we figured out not to die from it but there's a cardiac toxin <laughs> in the actual flesh of avocado it's called person and it's 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 not friendly okay it doesn't take a large amount of this to cause a significant problem and part of the reason i bring this up is like obviously you never see pet food that has avocado in it but boy do we love guac us humans we love it I actually am allergic to avocado, which is hilarious. I'm like, yeah, I follow the rest of the animal kingdom's rules. <laughs> the rest of you guys have at it. I, I do envy you. It's a great protein source. It is very healthy in terms of its nutritional profile. But with the caveat of this little heart sniper in the background here, um, as you can see, just to let you guys know, because birds, I would say, overrepresented for getting into this. Only need one mil for it to kill a cockatiel in 24 hours. We are... One mil is like not a lot, not a lot. Um, 
their crops on average can hold about like five to six mils of food. So less than 10% of that in the crop and they're fast, right? And, you know, food is love. All right. That's, that's the rule. This is the safe place. Food is love. We eat with our birds. Okay. And we usually are sharing hopefully healthy foods, bird owners. I see you out there. Hopefully we're sharing healthy foods, but like it's a thing. We're communal eaters. We're social eaters. I love eating with birds. It's awesome. And like you blink and then you forgot there's guac on the table. 30 seconds is enough exposure for you to be bringing this animal to the hospital. Okay. And it tastes delicious to them and they don't know the difference. Now, some Amazons would be like, I'm gonna hold off on that. And sometimes I think maybe because it's native, like it's a wild caught Amazon, it knows to stay away. Um, but for the most part, um, it can cause like, it can cause heart failure very quickly. So um, these are emergencies and I've had almost all species exposed to it, but the ones that do not do very well unless we intervene very quickly are birds. Okay, so they're going to look like they're breathing heavy. Um, they're going to have a high heart rate. Like if you're holding them and you can feel it through their chest, you don't want to squeeze. But if you just feel a flutter and it's way, 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 way faster, um, that might be a sign that we're, you know, tachycardic um, and, and heart failure. And I can say this and it hurts my heart to say it. I had a, a pet African gray that had a tumor that metastasized to the lungs. And I'm telling you as a person who is absolutely OCD about pain recognition, um, being able to monitor cryptic signs in, in pets, like even my pet bird had gone into heart failure and it was very challenging for me to be able to decipher it. Um, all I saw was just like, yeah, I can't get around as fast as I used to. I'm just going to chill out. And I'm just like, well, you're not a 50 year old African gray. You're a 20 year old African gray. What's going on? Um, it wasn't avocado toxicity, but I just shared that to say that sometimes these signs can be really challenging um, firsthand to appreciate, which is why it's also really important that if you have an exotic veterinarian in your area, seriously, it's really important to try to do routine wellness exams because knowing their baselines really helps us to qualify when something's wrong, okay? Um, oxalate rich foods, um, I red eared slider, converting them to greens, you know, making them eat greens and like, I'm like, oh, some rhubarb accidentally got into the tank. Get that out, <laughs> get that out fast. So um, other things in the rhubarb family in terms of um, soluble oxalates, beets, eggplants, um, those things can basically, how do I put this gently? Calcium knife shards to the kidney. That's as light as I can put it, all right? Um, it is literally like little pieces of glass to the kidney, little, yeah. So we don't like it. We don't like it. We keep these particular groups of, um, you know, foods away from our friends. See, I kept food as simple as I could. I'm not saying there are other ones. I'm just saying these are the most common ones. Now we're getting into some plant toxicities. And again, safe place, trust bubble. Please do not shoot me <laughs> when we go through this list, okay? I am a plant fanatic. Like my apartment low key looks like a little bit of a jungle. Now in all fairness to me, I grow some food for myself and I grow it for my pet reptiles. Um, love hibiscus. I got a bunch of hibiscus trees. Have to be very careful about some of the other plants that I have. Um, and what's, I will say this as a general rule. The plants that are super hardy and hard to kill um, are the ones that are obviously usually um, advertised in like pet stores and things. Um, the ones that are also very, um, tend to clean the air, right? So we're thinking of these like great ways in which we can improve the, the air health in our homes um, and things that can tolerate low level light. I want to say, um, with the exception of some flowering bulbs, those are the ones you got to watch out for <laughs> in terms of things that are accidentally ingested. With the exception of some ficus and then like hibiscus, just assume anything else in your apartment could be a problem for a pet, okay? Assume it. I'd much rather you err on the side of caution and look it up than to be like, well, he looks fine now. Um, and then we find out after the fact. I say this lovingly. I'm not sure if um, these clients might be on the call, but we had um, 
two guinea pig pets come in um, and uh, the owners had gotten kind of like farmer's markets. I'm not sure if people are familiar with like co-ops um, where like you can pay monthly and then they send you fresh fruit and things like that. It's a very nice organic way to try to, you know, add some variety and have a communal sense of gardening and food sharing. Um, there was unfortunately an herb in one of the deliveries that they got that ended up, we found out, unfortunately, the hard way ended up being toxic to the pet guinea pigs. Um, and you talk about heartbreak. I'm still pretty upset about it. Um, so I, I tell people to be very careful about uh, the food sources that they're offering. And if you even see a small nibble on a plant, a household plant, it's worth it to look it up, okay? Some of the things that I'm saying, like take a picture of this, save it in your phone. Those are the ones we're gonna focus on right now. The list is exhaustive. For those of you who are my colleagues joining me online through all of the various colleges, ACZM, big up to you, AREV, big up to you, AAZV, AAFV, NAG, AEMV. These are my people. This is all like scientific doctor stuff. All of these doctors are in uh, different organizations for different unique species that are not cats and dogs. I'm sending my love your way. They understand when we're studying for boards, we, um, you know, Fowler, may rest in peace, godfather of zoo medicine. Uh, he used to give us these lectures on plant toxicities. I used to think like this was gonna be the hardest part of my test and like till this day it is. But when I tell you it was so important that we remembered it, so important that we remembered it because it carries over with you no, what, no matter what species you're dealing with. These are the, I wanna say the hot 95, hot 97, <laughs> top five, okay, of the things that I tell people to be um, careful about. In general, um, flowering succulents, this little guy here is a really uh, lovely one. You see them in pet, like plant stores, sometimes grocery stores very often. They flower for a really long time. They're very drought resistant. You're like, oh, if it's really that resistant and it's that pretty, that's mother, right? Red, that's mother nature's sign of telling you back up. <laughs> I'm not the one. Like it's a warning, okay? And it means it. Maybe the red is for the fact that it'll come after your heart. Not saying it's the only color it comes in. I'm just saying sometimes warning colors are warning colors for the animal kingdom, not just for us, okay? So cardiac glycosides is something you will see pop up in the, in the verbiage for things that are terrifying in terms of toxicities, okay? Um, azaleas, very pretty. Uh, this is in the rhododendron family. Again, you look that bright, that fluffy, that pretty. Um, this actually causes some um, cholinergic um, concerns. So SLUD stands for salivation, so we're drooling. Lacrimation, so tears. And that means tears and stuff coming out of my nose because when I cry, my nose runs, okay? So you see discharge coming from the eyes and nose. Salivating, U, U is for urination. So I, it almost seems like I'm urinating and I, I can't control it like just fluids and diarrhea. So it's like all fluids are trying to come out of me and not at the times they're supposed to come out and uncontrolled, okay? This is what that toxin causes um, in general. And um, when it's been exposed in large amounts and if, if we don't give medications to stop it from causing this cholinergic um, problem, um, we will see kind of like upgrades in terms of like the next level of seriousness. And, and that can be paralysis, um, that can be wobbliness to the point where I can't stand, seizures, and then unfortunately cardiac effects. Then we have, um, I wanna say like the catch-all of like the air pure, I call them the air purifiers. There's always some Pinterest list that says, NASA says these are the best air cleaning, cleaning plants on the planet. You should have one of these in your apartment or your home. They're like stupid to take care of. They can go without water for forever. They don't need any light and they make the air better. I'm guilty of this. I love me a good piece, Lily. Ooh, I love umbrella paint. Anything that I can make it feel like it's tropical because I'm a reptile, I need it to be less concrete, right? Pothos, everywhere, all day, everywhere I can find it. It's, it's really easy to propagate. You, we, we gift it to friends. You put, a, you put a stem in a water and it starts to make roots. It's not hard <laughs> to make copies of it. And it's a runner, which means it's a cheap plant that can, you can make an entire plant wall with. It's very pretty if you're very, very into different um, variations of it. These are insoluble oxalate holders. So this stuff is going to cause an intense irritation to the mucosa, anything that's mucosal. 
So if we eat it, my lips are burning, my throat's burning, my mouth's burning, now my stomach's burning. And you can imagine the clinical signs you're going to see with that. Ugh, drooling, everything swollen, a lot of irritation. For animals that can vomit, you might see them vomit because you're like, the stomach's like, we're not here for this. Are you crazy? Like, get it out, get it out, get it out. Okay. And then acorns, leaves of oak trees. Um, these are two categories of acids that like to really mess with the liver and like try to shut it down. I'm going to leave my comment about zebras out of this. But those of you who deal with hoofstock <laughs> are equid friends, you know what I'm talking about. I'm not going to say I would throw some of these at some zebras, but they need to stop bullying people. All right. Hopefully you're not having like a ready source of this in your house. Um, but if you do have maybe some land tortoises that like you have some larger sulcutas and you have, you know, trees in your backyard, you have an outdoor space for them reasons to be concerned. Then we have outdoor plants. Um, I'm very happy to brag. Um, my family in Philly, um, they're master gardeners. They build pollinator gardens. The Philadelphia Horticultural Society comes to the backyard. They judge us. They say, you got a fantastic garden. This is great. We say, here's our bees. Here's our boxes. Here's our pollinator friendly, you know, local plants that we replanted here. We're the people that have the signs in the yard. Don't kill the weeds, you know? And that's all fine and dandy, but here's a fun story. Uh, some of these things that we wouldn't necessarily go and try to opportunistically eat, definitely, again, they're part of a natural ecosystem. Oleander is very pretty. And I'm pretty sure I don't have to say much more about <laughs> how toxic oleander is. Um, again, it's a heart toxin, okay? The one thing you might not have on your radar as much, and I actually didn't learn until I was in another country, is that milkweed is another one. Um, grows all over the place. And why might I care about that? Because pollinator friendly garden, you know, we want to support the monarchs trying to help all pollinators on the planet. We're trying to do the most for butterflies and monarchs love this stuff. <laughs> so you might, you know, you see a field of them or someone's thinking about planting a more pollinator friendly garden. You'd be surprised, like the week's not hard to propagate and it's a pretty robust plant. Um, so not only do I have a problem now with the milkweed that's making the cardiac toxin, if I have any bug eating friends that are pets, we can't have them eat those monarchs because now they got some cardiac toxin in them too. And they've co-evolved. So like they're vibes, they're buddy. They have a buddy system. Animals that were not from the Northeastern hemisphere should not be <laughs> dealing with that. Um, I'm a Ross graduate. I went to that school in um, St. Kitts and then finished at LSU right after Katrina. Missed me one time, but hit my destination by the time I got to LSU. Um, there was oleander and milkweed everywhere, which was really interesting is all the native animals there were like, stay back, no problem. It was always when we brought our pets to the island, our companion friends from the United States, that they had never been exposed to these plants before. And so all of a sudden we see these animals having toxicities and we had to learn about the local floor really fast. Um, so I tell people some animals don't even realize they're toxin, especially if they're not, if they've not had a natural exposure to it, um, if they're not a native species. Okay, so then we're gonna move the pesticides and baits. Okay, we're getting through it. You guys are doing great. Pesticides. These are the ones I'm gonna say that kind of sneak under the radar. Um, and because some of them are advertised as things that might be helpful rather than harmful um, to you and your family namely pyrethrin pesticides. Now, I don't want to go on a rant, but I'm going to. Sometimes you will see pyrethrin pesticides in a dilute form on the shelves of a number of different pet stores that try to help you deal with mite problems, especially for the exotic species. Um, you will find this in reptile targeted um, products, sometimes birds, some scary stuff. Um, this is what chrysanthemums make naturally. They're out here doing their own pest control. We like that. We're here for that. <laughs> Beautiful flowers, brightly colored. I wonder why. <laughs> You'll see a bunch of bugs, you know, tearing up chrysanthemums. That's why they have such full blooms. Anyways, um, pyrethrin toxicity is also marketed as the safer, um, like, um, 
anti-pesticide for people that need to fumigate their houses if they're experiencing like any water bug infestations, things like that. And it's safer because quote unquote, it's natural. It's from flowers. So this is one of those situations where, you know, you can't always um, assume that natural means better or safe. And so I would say more often than not, I've had more pyrethrin toxicity cases from fumigations of homes as a natural um, fumigation process than even toxicity sustained from things experienced from over-the-counter purchases of pest stores, okay? This shuts your nervous system down. It's not fun. It's not fun seeing an animal, hoping an animal can recover from this. All of the nerves that control your ability to walk, your ability to breathe, the control the muscles <laughs> that allow you to expand your lungs, um, it shuts that down. Um, I've been so fortunate to get one bird through a pyrethrin toxicity um, that was is as extreme as what I'm painting right now. And it took a week. Um, and every day we were hoping that we had another day. So um, if you have any situations where your home is being fumigated, obviously we don't like aerosolized pesticides for people either. But if this is marketed as something that's safe, you really need to have your animals outside of the airspace. This goes for anything that's in a cage. It's not specific to birds, not specific to mammals. Get your fish, your amphibians out of there, okay? Because residues come down and hit the water as well. And it's going to sound really silly, but sometimes iatrogenic exposures happen if you have pet invertebrates, especially for our tarantula owners and our scorpion owners. Um, this is something that's easily avoidable. We think because we have them in these like, you know, rather acrylic tanks and things like that or glass tanks that it, it might be less of a, of a threat, but residues are real. You know, if you handle your Chilean rose and they happen to walk on a surface that had some of this on it, um, you know, it, it could easily be avoided. So I tell people to be mindful of that non-food grade diatomaceous earth for our chicken owners out there. We are here for our plant owners. I see you. We use this as a natural, you know, get all of the pest, get all of the uh, bug eating things off of our plants. And sometimes this is also marketed to put in the chicken coops to try to reduce uh, louse burdens. Okay. It's basically microscopic glass. Okay, this was ground down crustaceans from like way back in the day. So um, if you've ever handled it, you'll actually see they say, please put something over your nose, please something over your eyes, um, because this has become very, very um, um, irritating, especially if you inhale it or get it in your eyes. You never believe it. We had a kinkachu come in here one time with a diatomaceous earth toxicosis, and it bled a lot chronically for some time. Um, so I tell people be very careful, um, or at least when you're handling it, just make sure it's 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 not in a condensed, closed airspace, um, and that you're doing your best to minimize it being aerosolized, touching any mucous membranes or any animal's ability to inhale it. Organophosphates and um, carbamates, that's usually a wildlife thing we're still seeing when there's exposures. Um, rare for you to see that in a pet situation, but you know what? If you let your pet off, you know, if you're walking them through wherever you're walking them through, because you want a nature hike, like be mindful. Um, there are some things in the ground. Here's where my reptiles are going to get some respect. Wild reptiles and the rehabbers on the call need to be listening to me right now. They are models for ecotoxicity. We know what's in the ground when we study their tissue levels. That's facts. So um, don't get me wrong. I have a 31 year old roommate. Her name is Cordelia. She is my Russian tortoise, okay? She was found. She had unfortunately been confiscated from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. They found her. She had kicked a gopher tortoise out of his burrow in Louisiana. They were like, we're pretty sure this thing is not native. I was like, bring it on to me. Um, so when these animals escape and they're going into terrains that they were never designed to go into, uh, be mindful that they might have exposures to these things. And then slug and snail baits, which I hope you you don't need a reason to ever use, um, like box turtles, like slugs are like their cocaine, like they really like slugs, so we don't, you know, but just be mindful, um, that can cause some disease too, and I'm just lumping pesticides and things into a, a general category. Um, rodenticides, I would say for those of us who also dabble with half cats and dogs, the 
colleagues on the line who deal with cat and dog medicine, this is a bleeding situation, internal bleeding and organ failure. It's not pleasant, but the things you want to look for um, are pale mucous membranes. So if you can look at the lip or you can look at the nasal philtrum, or even if you can flip the eyelid back just a little bit, any of that look like less pink, you know, almost white in color, scariness, um, dark stools. Why dark? Well, if we're bleeding in our stomach from ulcers, has to, there's acid in there because the acid is designed to digest our food. And so this is one way we localize where a gastrointestinal bleed is happening. If it's upper versus lower, if it's upper, we'll see, unfortunately, that blood, um, you know, have an enzymatic reaction to the enzymes that are in our stomach. Um, and it'll go from red to dark brown, sometimes dark blackish type of color. So like tarry. Um, it helps us to localize where there's a bleed in the gastrointestinal tract. And of course, if we're bleeding, weakness, you know, neurologic signs, fertilizers is the other thing. And I would have to say, this is why now I have all of my fertilizers for my, like my house plants in double protected Tupperwares, <laughs> uh, because that's a lot of nitrogen, a lot of zinc, iron toxicity. So those heavy metals come back into play. GI burns, I tend to grow um, tortoise grass for my tortoise and like little Tupperwares. Yeah. I try to make sure I don't get the one that's like fertilizer loaded, okay? Because I want to make sure she's eating her grass. I don't, if she accidentally takes a couple of scoops of like the dirt that it's been planted in, I want to make sure we're not exposing her to anything crazy. Um, compost is the other thing. For those of us that are, our, you know, organic um, planters, um, we grow our food, big up to you. Um, anything super moldy in there, especially like old peanut shells and stuff like that, aflatoxins can... Um, be produced. And that is a specific, I want to kill the liver. I'm going to make the liver melt type of toxin to the point where it's used experimentally to figure out which drugs can get it to stop. It is a go for broke type of situation. Um, so just be mindful. Don't get me wrong. Um, if you vermipost, uh, for those of you who are learning, um, sometimes we'll have earthworms in our compost piles just to help break down the debris, make sure everything's natural, and that's great. If you're getting ready to snatch some earthworms out of your compost heap, I need these guys to be in another receptacle, eating for at least 48 hours a diet that was not compost, so that you don't accidentally cause compost toxicity to your insect-eating animals. Okay. Pet medications. The things that like to kill parasites are usually the things that can be accidentally overdosed for exotic species and cause a problem. Um, ivermectin is one of those. Okay. Strongid, you can leave it that way. Um, ivermectin, we know, causes problems in certain species of dogs, CNS disease. Turtles, this is a no go. Um, and most people think turtles are the only reptiles that have problems with it. Wrong, wrong. Colubrid snakes don't like it. You have to be very careful sometimes with the amounts. Um, metronidazole. This medication is used to treat giardia. Um, it happens to be an anti-parasitic control, but it's also a really good um, anaerobic um, antibiotic. It controls a lot of anaerobes. It controls like certain infections that are crazy scary, like clostridial infections and stuff like that. So metronidazole is worth its weight in gold. It's an anti-malarial. You're like, what is this, a wonder drug? Like it's got a lot of things that it could do. Um, unfortunately, I can tell you from experience, when we were first starting to try to develop doses that were appropriate, we're using things off label to just try to help exotic species. Um, and you know, every test had not been done in every species on the planet. So a lot of the dose ranges are all over the place. Um, and we were doing the best we could. We were trying to extrapolate from what that dose would be for like a person that had a similar disease process or a cat or a dog. Now we know that the metabolism is really you know, different. What ends up happening is you start to see a lot of references for really high doses of metronidazole, and that can become can, can become toxic, um, and it becomes CNS toxic too. Like 20 mg per kg, should, we never have to go above that. Hundreds, when we're looking into that, honestly, you're, you're setting yourself up for more problems. We're way past the nadir to deal with any of the four things we're trying to, to stop, um, you know, causing harm to a, a pet or a patient. Um, Fipronil, toxic the rabbits, let's not do it. Fenbendazole, I'm talking to you rabbit owners, okay? This is an antifungal medication. Like it's not something, we tend to use it a lot to 
limit the spread of E. caniculi infections, um, at least through the kidney, because that's what we have evidence of. Once those spores get to other places, um, usually they're chilling. Um, Benbendazole as a treatment for um, E. caniculi has been a historic thing. You just have to be very careful. Um, because things that like to target fungi, which are like our close relatives, can cause liver disease. And there has been liver disease reported in animals on normal doses of imbendazole reported to be able to treat this disease process. So I tell people to be very careful. You really don't want to double dose on this thinking that you're going to double down on taking care of the infection. And then antiseptics. This is for my reptile people. Um, we have caused documented toxicosis in bathing turtles in Chlorhexidine, don't do it. Okay. Uh, Chlorhexidine is can be very toxic in general. It can be cytotoxic at various dilutions. The other reason you want to be very careful about this, and this is now for captive snakes, but also to my wildlife crew that's out there, there is a fungus, um, unfortunately, that's wrecking a lot of our native snake population species. It's a it's a fungus that will eat through hair and it will eat through scales. And that's crazy. Um, but um, my colleague, Matt Allender, my buddy, did this study. His lab did a study where they were like, all right, this thing likes, this fungus likes to grow. It likes to really, really go after keratin and it can be really invasive to snakes. What, you know, what can we do to try to clean wounds that have this stuff on it? And they tested all concentrations of chlorhexidine. So like straight straight, no chaser, like a little bit dilute, you know, all the, all the things super. And this fungus grew at every strength of chlorhexidine. We want to be a part of the solution. Yes. So just be careful on this. Again, this is one of those situations where, you know, more is not better. Um, this should be used as an antiseptic. That means we're trying to get the bacteria off or the, you know, the fungus that's responsive to it off of healthy tissue. We don't want to damage the tissue that's there. And this is very much guilty for that. So you have to be careful. For those of you who work with me, they know I don't, me and chlorhex, we don't vibe at all. I'm a dilute betadine girl for a number of reasons. That's a whole nother topic. Um, human medications. I don't like, we're not, WebMD has its uses up to a certain point. You, I, we can't give you a residency over the phone. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff that we spent a lot of years trying to figure out. There's no way for us to try to communicate that to some owners so quickly that we're able to like demystify your concerns. So if we can't tell it to you and we took many years to have to learn these things, I guarantee you it's going to be a challenge for you to try to put this together by doing an internet search and then thinking we have a PhD. Don't do it. Don't do it. We're still learning some of this stuff. That's how we know. Like there's not an answer for everything. And medicine is not one plus one equals two. Um, that's why it's so hard. So I tell people any prescribed medications, I don't care how safe it says it's on the bottle for you. Your pet ingested or has exposure to it, you need to let us know um, because you would be surprised. There's not, there's not many things that can't, cannot be toxic. It, it just depends on the dose and the metabolism. In our jobs, we're the comparative anatomy specialists. We're the ones that are gonna be able to tell you Oh, these are the systems it's going to hit. This is what we need to protect for those systems, how we can really safeguard your, your pet. Over-the-counter medications that we're used to having, I want to say in abundance, um, since COVID has afflicted a number of us. Yeah, interesting. These toxicities started to skyrocket in pets when we were at home getting sick from COVID because it's just more readily available. Um, ferrets are no, I mean, come on. I love them. We'll get into that a little bit later, but ferrets, I would say, are probably a little overrepresented in our exotics family um, for getting into medications they're not supposed to. Um, most birds have a common enough sense to spit it out if it at least tastes bad. Ferrets aren't doing all of that. They need to ingest, consume, and assassinate. So thought process behind <laughs> discriminating what's safe versus not, not really high on their radar. Um, recreational drugs. I'm saying this with love. I'm saying this with absolute love. Marijuana toxicities are a thing in pet animals. And for us, it scares us tremendously when a herbivore gets into it. Why? Because now I got to wait to see a prolonged digestive process. And some of the stuff is going to recycle in a fermentative vat for a long period of time. And so that scares us. 
Have there been reports of this? In tortoises, yes. In iguanas, yes. In rabbits, yes. So I tell people, keep things out of reach, please. <laughs> please, um, because what you don't wanna see is your pet having seizures for seven days in the hospital. And that's not an exaggeration, okay? And it's sad to have to say it, be careful, okay? Inhalation toxicities. These pictures are to remind you that Teflon lives in very interesting places. This stuff literally melts the lungs of birds. Bleeding in lungs is what Teflon does to birds, okay? And if you can do it to that, then you got to, like once the coating is burned, you got to ask yourself, why do I have this in my house? Why am I using it? Some uncommon places most people don't think about. I know I gravitated toward nonstick cookware immediately, but I forgot about the bake pans. I forgot about old space heaters. And I forgot about hair straighteners because I have locks. But that's another place where Teflon is coated because you don't want to burn your hair. And so just be mindful of that. This is the trust bubble. This is the safe space. We're trying to make it as egalitarian as possible. We really want to make sure we're looking out to protect our patients um, from harm. Inhalation toxicities. Uh, nicotine goes for topical too, especially for bird owners. Um, Ozone-based air purifiers is another thing I think, um, especially unfortunately due to COVID, all of us ran to go get air purifiers, we want the air as pure as possible, you know, and some of these air purifiers use ozone generation as a method of trying to purify the air. For those of you and us, safe space, that have any asthma or chronic bronchitis or anything like that, um, pulmonologists will tell you real fast, you do not use ozone-based anything in your house because it's toxic, the type 2 pneumocytes which is lung cells, not the tubes getting the air to the lungs, the actual lung cells it's toxic to. I need my lung real estate. I wish I could trade up to be a reptile or a bird on any given day where I just, we're not going to do it. So if my doctor's telling me it's toxic to my lung cells, you can only imagine what it's going to do to other animals, okay? Car exhaust fumes, humidifiers with filters. I'm okay with the air being a little moist. We actually need that. What we don't need is an accumulation of fungal spores in the filters, okay? Because then you're jet blasting things that can be toxic. So you gotta be very, very, very careful with that. Chemical and electric. And this is gonna be like the last crazy slide and then we can start getting into like the species specific banter that I think I'm known for. We celebrate our pets, we love them, but we're gonna get into what they're known for, okay? Um, topical steroid creams. Um, whether that be anti-itch or hormone replacement creams, be mindful, especially with birds um, and rabbits. These animals don't have a high tolerance for exposure to steroids in general of any form. <laughs> um, and so it can really actually cause their white blood cell counts to plummet if they're exposed to large amounts of it. Um, hair removing um, creams, coloring agents, hair coloring agents, none of that stuff needs to be near your pet. Spray paint, you're like, why on earth would she say that? This seems like not a big deal. We've come in, we've had some turtles come in with some decked out shells. And for those of us who deal with wildlife, this is a crime. We have some, some animals that have been spray painted, so namely reptiles that have been spray painted. It's not okay, okay? Um, household cleaners, obviously, um, glues, specifically the glue traps, I would say that is for a number of animals, you know, pet birds, um, the actual rodents themselves that are feral rodents that people are trying to, it's not a humane way to go, okay? But when we're trying to remove that from an animal that's, you know, we either need to humanely go to heaven because that's what the bait was intended for, or from animal that accidentally got exposed, usually it's small birds, pet birds and wild birds, this is a nightmare. It's, it's not good to, to get them through this process. Obviously crude oil, petroleum, um, antifreeze ingestion, our dog owners, we know that's, we don't like that propylene glycol ingestion. We, we want our kidneys, okay? And then cord bites, I'm talking to you ferret owners, rabbit owners, our little knowledge will get into that as well, okay? All right, we're gonna take a little bit of a break. I promise the rest of this is going to be festive. I promise it. I know it's a heavy topic, but I just want to make sure we really represent all of the animals, uh, the need to have some representation because in all fairness, these are the groups of animals that are usually underrepresented. So we're taking the time night to celebrate them. Signs of emergencies and exotic pets. The good news is we talked about what pain looks like in another lecture, okay? 
If you've not seen this lecture, I guarantee you it's hilarious um, and informative. And that's a hard thing to do when talking about pain. Please access this at another time. Um, but it's going to be really important because sick animals are painful animals. So we want to make sure we're not missing. And these guys are so cryptic. We really want to make sure we're not missing any subtle signs. Again, they are not hardwired to, you know, for you to be their therapist. They're not here to tell you what's wrong. They're really designed to try to hide illness because if they were in the wild, they would be taken out. So their clinical signs can be very, very, very subtle. Um, again, this is one of the infographics that we have um, for and we'll send them out tomorrow for everybody. We'll make sure everybody gets them. Perfect, perfect. And the link to the lecture. It's a really good one. Nice. Um, so uh, remember there's grimace scales for our rodent friends, for our ferret friends, for our pet pig friends. I can look at your face and tell you how, and tell how painful you are. Yeah, those things are validated. Those are things that science we've got now, okay? Uh, for my wildlife people, my zoo people, harbor seals, there's a facial grimace scale for harbor seals. I, I kid you not, okay? So let's get into the species specific things this is where we can commiserate together. Bunny owners, okay? She took my carrot, I took her power. You're right about that. Um, rabbit signs. Rabbits, we're looking for airway emergencies. They're up, they are obligate nasal breathers. So a lot of air needs to come through here, not a lot of real estate below in the actual lung area. Anything that's blocking an upper airway is terrifying. Anything that's reducing an animal's oxygen carry capacity and, and you're um, a rabbit or a rodent, terrifying. So if we see a pale nose, if we see eyelids that are pale, if we see nasal flaring. So with these guys, remember I said, air starved looks like arms out, neck outstretched. They're not, rabbits are like, what do I look like? We're not doing all of that. Rabbits are like, and they will nasal flare. I'm going to see if this, I thought it's going to play. Hopefully you'll see it. I want you guys to take a look at, can you see how pronounced the nasal openings are going? The nares. When I tell you what this chick had, you're going to be like, and she's grooming and flirting. Grooming and flirting simultaneously. Her red blood cell percentage in her body normally should be 35, 40%, 19%. So we're at transfusion level low. And she oral pharyngeally reflux food into her sinuses. So not only is she anemic, she got a bunch of inflammation in her upper airway and she's still standing and flirting with you. The only reason I know this rabbit is having an, an emergency airway is because of the nose flaring. And she, look how hard she's trying to be normal, okay? Outstretched neck, we talk about that. With rabbits, the other thing is if you see the chest moving and the abdomen moving when the breaths are happening and they look like, it looks like a flutter, that's no, okay? That's not a dance, that's a problem. We call that disjointed breathing pattern, okay? Not as scary. Um, this is my, my boyfriend came in to see me today. Another sign we see for sick rabbits, when they're not eating or drinking and you see an absence of fecal material or urine for greater than eight hours, it's a problem. This thing makes a horse look slow when it comes to his GI tract complexity. It is really the only species in the world that has the GI that it has, okay? Drooling and not eating, that's a dental disease is an emergency in these guys. Presence of true diarrhea is terrifying in these guys because they've just got clostridium on tap in their cecums and it can make toxins. So not only does this bacteria that normally likes to like grind up their food for them, if it's not getting the food, it gets mad and starts releasing toxins in their system, which is why true diarrhea is terrifying for us. And then bleeding from anywhere. Um, now you'll remember this guy picture, he looks really stretched out and he's pretty okay, he looks very comfortable. Neurologic emergencies are another thing that we see in rabbits, an inability to sand. Um, sometimes it's because of fractures. Sometimes it's because of dizziness. Full disclosure, um, I have vertigo, so I know what this feels like. And for those clients that bring their pets in that have any type of neurologic disease, they know I am on one when it comes to this. Um, rolling, collapse, seizures. Now this, this animal looks obviously um, like we've got CNS signs, but our friend um, before, the one that was stretched out, is actually epileptic and has strokes often. So CNS disease can look 
not as obvious as you think. Let's see if we can go here. There we go. Guinea pigs. Everything we talk about for the bunnies, difficulty breathing. For these guys, aside from a dental emergency and a respiratory emergency, difficulty breathing can mean gastric disease, heart disease, the GI tract is not moving. It can be my ovaries and our females are huge. And I mean, they get ridiculously big when they're cystic. It can also mean urinary obstructions, which is something that a lot of people might not be able to pick up on very easily. Um, you, these guys don't like lilies, by the way. Don't let them eat lilies, okay? That whole, the, the glass shards, microscopic glass to the kidneys, that happens with them if they eat. Don't let them do it, okay? Bleeding is an emergency, dehydration. I'm showing you a picture of the foot for a reason because these guys will not move when they are sick or painful. And they will sit there and they will sit there even if they urinate and defecate and they will not move. And we start to see that on their feet. We start to see these scabs, the swelling, inflammation, that's pododermatitis, chinchillas. I was very nice. I didn't put an inflammatory picture of chinchillas up this time. This one looks friendly, right? All right, this one looks sick, all right? These guys out of all of the herbivores are the least tolerant for um, what we call GI stasis, which really is functional ileus. The gut is not wanting to move. Motility has stopped, okay? When these guys have been on their, their crazy rant for five years and they're packing a little extra pounds and they suddenly stop eating, this is, I tell people, never starve a fat cat. Their pancreas doesn't like it. Their liver doesn't like it. They go into a ketoacidotic crisis pretty quickly. Heat extremes, we so rarely remember that. Cardiac disease, diarrhea, same scariness, the absence of feces, absence of urine. Some of these guys, um, unfortunately, are genetically epileptic. And if we see drooling, we concern about dental disease. Our ferret friends, yeah. For those of you who were not in the last talk, I kind of went on a rant about ferrets. I really do enjoy them. They're very pretty, aren't they? Not very smart, but they're very pretty. <laughs> and they're little assassins. <laughs> Chew first, eat first, bite first, mate first. Then think about the consequences, if I can think. But I can smell it. All right, diarrhea is a true emergency in these guys. A true emergency. Abnormal stool color is an absolute reason to bring them in. If it's dark or bloody, I need to see them. If it's neon green, I need to see them. Their shock organ is their GI tract, period. Anything that can go wrong with ferret at some point where it either started with the gut, if it didn't start with the gut, it's gonna end with the gut. Um, and it's, it's not a system that likes to be challenged. Vomiting, trauma, unfortunately accidents still happen, elevated body temperatures, Seizures, these guys get cancers really young on in their early part of their lives. And it's really sad, but they have seizures um, secondary to getting cancers that are almost like the reverse of diabetes. It's like too much insulin is being made. So it's eating all of my sugar too fast. Um, and we'll see, we'll see seizures. Also, we'll see them foaming at the mouth. And sometimes we'll see them trying to scratch at the roof of their mouths because it feels tingly because their blood sugar levels are so low. It's nastiness. Obstructions, because we don't know how to say stop when it comes to nibbling on any and everything. You can't tell a ferret not to be a ferret. Um, and then urinary obstructions, unfortunately. Two types. Sometimes these guys get stones. Sometimes these guys get stones that you can't even see on x-ray. That's really frustrating. But more often than not, they unfortunately will get adrenal disease, which is not an elevation of cortisol production, but actually sex hormones. And so our male guys, their prostates get really big and it kind of crushes the, the tube that takes the urine from the bladder to the outside world. And so they will appear to have a urinary obstruction when in fact it's because the prostate's enlarged. Sugar gliders and hedges, okay? Sugar gliders fight wounds all day every day. I have to say this. I don't understand why marsupials are a thing mother nature decided to design. They make zero sense to me. Um, I would be as angry as they are if I existed, okay? We can't figure out if we're mammals. We can't figure out if we're reptiles or birds. Um, really small, need a lot of space. I digress. They're exquisitely territorial, especially our little sugar glider friends. When someone says, what size cage? I'm like, do you have a city block? You have a couple of rooms you can spare that should be the size <laughs> of their space um, and you don't want to put you know 12 of these guys 
in a small cage. Fight wounds, notorious diarrhea, lethargy, prolapses, unfortunately, dental disease sometimes. Hedgies are kind of like our ferret friends in that like they develop cancers so quickly. It's really sad. Everybody overrepresents um, our reptile friends for the salmonella thing. I'm not saying it can't happen. I'm saying at least depending on the situation and the environment, if you can get it correct, sometimes they're not shedding as much or even shedding something that can get you sick. However, hedgehogs get salmonella a lot and it's a lot in their diarrhea. So let's be mindful that that's another source. Um, chicken owners, I'm putting you out there too. It's not always on the reptiles, all right? So be careful with diarrhea. Obviously bring them into the emergency room, but be careful with cleaning up afterwards. Make sure your hygiene is on point. Low body temperatures, um, masses and bleeding. These guys make a lot of cancer. It's really unfortunate. Um, and sometimes you'll just see them neurologic. They're unable to use their limbs. Hamsters and gerbils. I, for those of you who work with me or for those who are clients of mine, like I'm affectionate with everything and, and they're usually affectionate back with me. This is a gerbil. I love him so much. He could sit in my hand all day. I was massaging him. I was like, you need kisses. Um, gerbils and hamsters for not that I want to minimize either one of their subsets of problems, but just for the convenience of trying to make sure we can remember the big flags, masses, skin lesions, trauma, diarrhea, a lot of self scratching to the point where I'm bleeding. That's not good. Hair loss in hamsters is a big deal because there's three things that can do it and two of them are life-threatening. So it's not just a, a cosmetic concern. Um, and the difficulty breathing um, could mean a lot more than what it appears to be on the surface. Rats, this is our friend getting some acupuncture. That is a rat hugging me. And yes, rats hug. And this is why we love rats. They're amazing. All right, let's say that too. Not eating low blood sugar. Um, these guys should be eating all of the time. Breathing fast, difficulty breathing. There's a whole host of respiratory complexes that can cause a problem. We all think mycoplasma, but that's not the only thing that's wrecking the lungs of these species. For my rat owners, um, let's check in on this. Neurologic disease that's subtle to miss. These guys can get pituitary adenomas. The good news is there's a treatment for it an oral medication that could shrink this bad boy in as little as 48 hours. The bad news is sometimes we miss um, their clinical signs. If they seem like they can't see all of a sudden, if you sit them in the center of the cage and they have to be along the sides of the wall, they don't feel very comfortable venturing to the center. They're, they're, if you put them through that maze test, if they're head pressing, they could be breathing fast because they're painful. It's not always respiratory disease. And if they're reluctant to move from the wall, you need to get them in to see us ASAP, okay? Piggies, this one might play. These guys come through often. You like yum -yums. Let's see if you, that's me saying, you want your yum yums? I'm giving it an appropriate treat because it came in <laughs> for being um, having fecal lifts. So constipation's a real big problem in the city for piglets. Um, ingestion of things they're not supposed to. Call poison control ASAP, okay? Um, dog bite trauma, I'd say is next number two. Dental disease, dehydration. Um, hoof disease. And I'm just putting that out there. Leptospirosis is on the rise. Um, a number of places around the country, cats and dogs, be very careful. If these guys have been exposed to wild rodents, um, we vaccinate them for lepto. Um, if you see any weird skin lesions on them, there's a disease that you could get that they could give you. And then obviously, unfortunately, influenza. Um, I am going a little over, but I promise I will finish quickly. Uh, parrots and pigeons, anything hanging out of a body orifice is an emergency. We don't need any impromptu surgeries at home. We went through the toxicosis, so I don't even have to go through that list. Lameness on the left for female birds, specifically parrots, has a whole nother world of meaning to us. It could be an egg. It could be a renal disease issue. It could be a fracture. And there's no way you're going to figure this out at home. Bring them in. Specifically, if you see them holding up that left leg, that's really, it's a huge deal for us in the bird world. Not eating, this is a picture of a bird trying to show me that he's pretending to eat. Look at the eyes, half mass. They will crack seed and not even eat. Like they'll crack it, the holes will fall and they won't even ingest the seed because they're so hardwired to act like they're eating even if they're not. So proof of concept, monitor their fecal production to make sure they're truly eating. Sometimes we will see mutilation events, chronic feather plucking, you know, 
this, unless we're chewing it to the muscle belly, it might be an acute presentation of a chronic problem because they're good at hiding, okay? Always check the medial aspects of the thighs and on the wings if your pet birds will let you do that. They like to pluck there first when there's a problem because it can be hidden easily. Once we start going bare chested, the gig is up. Something's not right. Bleeding emergencies. This was my pet um, African gray that I was referring to earlier. You see bruising easily on your pet. That's a really weird, scary thing. Seizures, obviously fractures, inability to stand, difficulty breathing, all reasons to bring them in. All right, waterfowl friends, down bird. If it can't stand, eyes are at half mass. That's not good. Any discharge from anywhere. Understand there's a new flu strain right now. We don't think it's a big of a threat to backyard flocks, but it has shut down some wildlife hospitals. Understand when waterfowl start migrating and migratory birds start moving from one place to the next, your flocks become um, a risk for exposure, okay? Um, Looks like we need a crop bra. If you see a lot of like accumulation in the crop, that's a problem. Um, and then there are some infectious diseases that can cause um, neurologic disease. This is my friend right here. This is the record keeper. That's one of my patients just hanging out. That's not like jewelry. <laughs> I tell you guys, it's very rare when we're doing appointments. It's very rare that they're in a carrier in a cage. You're usually with me and they're, we're having a keeping moment. Okay. Um, respiratory distress and reptiles, scary. These are the guys who are like, yeah, we do that bird thing, plus we hold more air, plus we can handle not having air. So when, this is an orthopnic position in a snake, this is an air-starved snake. This is as scary as a voice change in a bird to me. When we see all reptiles, muscles going away from the head, we've not been able to digest food and we've been chronically wasting, okay? And it's a critical emergency, fractures. Was a pet that walked in that tried to go through like a cabinet. Okay. Reproductive disease is an emergency in reptiles. Let me be clear about that. These were on the inside of a turtle. I didn't break those shells. I don't even know what that one thing is with the clot on the inside. That was inside of a turtle outside of its uterus. Please go see your reptile pets. Okay. Sleeping upside down in a water bowl is a neurologic sign for a snake. And there's about four infectious diseases that can do this. And then there's some congenital disease that can do it. And that's what this is for our pie ball, um, for our um, spider ball, neuro, um, ball python owners out there. Sometimes the brain's not built right. All of this, you see bleeding, you see green on the ventrum, any color changes. That's bad in reptiles, you gotta call us. And any masses in the mouth or facial masses, you need to call us. Here's the thing, bearded dragons are not from North America. Why would they have exposure to fireflies? They don't. So when they actually accidentally ingest these things, it's quite toxic to them, okay? All the plants above we talked about, vitamin A and D, be very careful about that. That can actually cause some problems. Our amphibian and fish friends, Sick amphibians will soak in water bowls. They don't, they are not moving. We'll see skin color changes, which is terrifying. If they can't see, that's a problem. And if you see them shedding a lot, flag. Our fish friends, a lot of clinical signs. We're not swimming normally. We're piping. We're at the, you know, we're near the, um, the source where the water's agit agitated. Color changes, lethargy, loss of body condition, holes. This is um, hole in the head disease in this hospital. For our pet invert friends, okay. Hermit crabs uh, don't do really good when they're having delaying molts. It can take some time. They're a very fragile state at that point. Dehydration and blood loss is usually when we're dealing with them. Tarantulas, dehydration, our arms are in. We're really not trying, it's a hydraulic system. So if I'm dehydrated, I really can't move my legs out. Okay, diarrhea, foam at the mouth. There's a parasite that messes with the fangs and it could be terminal. So you see that you need to call us. And then trauma, if there's any exoskeleton loss. For our furry friends, our new world theraphosids, um, it's one thing to flick those, those hairs. It's another thing when you just see those hairs falling off. That's a problem. We need to get into it. You need to make sure everything's okay. Um, make sure you're treating your water. They do not like chlorine and make sure they've not had accidental exposure to pesticides. Foot injuries in our snail friends. I'm not going to talk about the snail species. You know who you are. You know what you're out there. Snail puppies. 
the audience knows what I'm talking about. Hissing cockroaches, Jiminy Cricket, the cutest little face underneath of the shell. They get obese and they get obstipated real fast. And that is an x-ray showing, that's a barium study. Food is love, but to a limit, okay? Mm -hmm. We just gotta be careful. Aquatic inverts, uh, predation is usually gonna be the biggest thing in water quality for our freshwater friends. Salt water, anytime there's a heavy metal in the water. See, we're not that different. Heavy metal's a problem anywhere it is, okay? There are some individual disease processes that will hit certain um, aquatic inverts before the most predation, infection, um, water toxicity for wildlife. And I'm saying this with love and we'll hopefully end on this note. They are not pets, okay? For our good Sams out there, if you really wanna do the best for them, realize the goal is always to get them back into the wild where they can thrive. They're not going to have a script for gabapentin or tramadol for the rest of their lives once they're in the wild, okay? And it makes them a tic-tac for a predator. We don't want them to have a lot of interaction with us. We want them to go back to the world so that they don't develop a handicap. Make sure you isolate them from other animals. They could be carrying diseases that can make you sick or any other animal sick. Seek veterinary assistance immediately. And you and your veterinarian need to get in touch with a licensed wildlife rehabilitator. It's the law. It's not optional. Okay. Um, usually all of our, all of our native species are state and federally protected. You can't illegally adopt um, a non-nuisance species into your home and be like, this is my mm -hmm. pet now. That's not the vibe. Makes a number of us upset. Okay. Um, veterinarians by law can triage wildlife species, afford immediate medical attention, stabilize them. But even we are just like, we actually are supposed to get them to a rehabber. So like, we're not removed from this list. Okay. Um, again, there's a number of diseases processes that can get you and your pet sick, so be careful to help them get them to the appropriate place, okay? There's a whole website for our friends in New York. You choose the species, you choose the zip code, it'll give you a list of the people you can call. First aid, isolate them, reduce stress, airway emergencies, don't overhandle them, reduce bright lights, noises, sounds. For ferrets that look really, really dizzy, try to give them some carnivore care or protein source so that we can prevent a seizure on the way to the hospital. Bleeding emergencies, all I need is gauze if you can get it on it, okay? Do not mess with open fractures. These are pictures of safe ways to transport a sick pet to the hospital. Um, I actually, this is one of my chronic head tilt bunnies. I actually love it. It's literally, and I put this in a Tupperware and we're out the door. Um, pads, padded areas along the caging for our neurologic animals. Don't put food and water in the carrier in an emergency situation. If you can put a paper towel or something absorbent on the base, that's really helpful because if anything comes out, we're able to evaluate that. For our bird friends, make it now. Make a Tupperware, you get your Dremel, you Dremel some holes to the sides at the top of a Sterlite container, Tupperware container. Um, this is for like a carrying case for like a pet visit. But like when they're sick, I need them in the Tupperware with a paper towel on the bottom, some towel on the padding and get them to the door. Look, not that different for our pet reptile friends, okay? Snakes, especially large snakes, ideally if you can get them into a, a pillowcase or to a laundry bag, and then put them in the Tupperware, make sure there's holes in everything so it's it's aerated. For our fish, our fish friends, and we'll put this in the um, to-do list, um, there are portable air stones, there are portable water heaters that are USB charged friendly, so um, they're very cost effective. So for our air breathers, they can usually handle it a little bit better, but if we need to keep the water oxygenated and transport, know that you can provide that. Um, this is my little friend. He had a nasty like neuroblastoma behind his eye. It was weird. We had to take his eye out, but like that's his best friend in the world. That cat, and I'm putting that out there. You can never judge a species attachment in terms of their buddies. Okay. Amphibians and inverts, make sure small cups, a little bit of bedding on the bottom. Keep it simple. What you bring to the vet with your pet is a checklist of these things, pictures of anything it was exposed to. If you can do it, picture of the droppings, picture of the regurgitation, broken toys, screws. If there's a sample of feces, urine, sometimes regurgitation, bring it. And then if you can bring a food sample, whatever it had last, that's going to be really important. All right. So I know those I went over and I'm so sorry. It was a lot. It was a lot. And I thank you for being attentive and weathering the storm with me. Um, I want to make sure at the end of this talk, you remember the ABCs of emergency types toxicities, trauma, and organ-specific diseases for your pets. I would recommend keeping a picture of the common signs of pain in your pet on your phone. 
usually everybody has that on tap. So um, just helps you go through that list of what looks like abnormal so you know how to respond. Also take a picture of the little slide that had your animals, common emergencies. Um, I have Tupperwares for all of my reptiles and all my pets ready to go. Um, I've, I've, I've been through too many hurricanes, too many tornadoes. I'm from the South. So I'm on some emergency response type stuff real fast. Um, make sure you have these things ready preemptively so that you are in a place where you can respond very quickly for your pet's safety. Um, and just remember, reduce sound, reduce light, um, get them to the vet as quickly as you can. All right. These are some resources. They'll also be in the handout. And that was my last slide, you guys. I'm happy to stick along. Thank you. I know we went over, but I'm happy to take questions. I know there's a lot of you. I'm told there's almost 650 of you. So be patient with me. Yeah, this <laughs> I can is... take, I can feel the most common questions or the most repeated questions. Um, happy to continue and engage this conversation in the future as well. Well, this was phenomenal. Thank you so much. I know there was a lot of information and we'll send it out tomorrow. Um, so let's get to a few questions um, before the construction starts. <laughs> Ken, yeah, I'm sorry. You, guys you hear here. it now? They, they held it off. Yeah. Just for those of you who don't know, we're doing a massive construction project on the hospital and hopefully, so it's for a good purpose. Um, all right. So let's see. What is the most common herptile injury and or ailment that you encounter either in the wildlife or exotic species? Ooh, very good question. Um, for my captive friends, uh, female reproductive emergencies, overrepresented. When I tell you I'm a pretty boss ultrasounder of reptiles at this point, I say that with pride, <laughs> um, not ego. It's sad because it's something that can be overlooked very quickly. Sometimes it's not that they're making eggs, it's that their ovaries are rupturing before they can make eggs. And so I would say, um, I've had some rotating interns with me. I think something like six bearded dragons all last week. And then there's leopard geckos and then there's turtles <laughs> and all the yeah. females all have the same problem. So I have to say for our captive friends, for our wildlife friends, um, unfortunately, infectious diseases and trauma. Okay. Well, okay. Um, we had a question about, let's see, do you, is there a group of exotic animals that is more susceptible to lead poisoning or is mo more commonly exposed? Well, that's a really good one. I think it depends where you are regionally. So when I was in Philly, everything, like you'd be surprised, I actually had more rabbits come in with lead poisoning than birds because they were chewing on, you know, walls of houses that were built in the 1800s. Um, and some places in Delaware where animals were outside and exposed, it wasn't even just zoo animals. It was wildlife that was exposed to ground, you know, unfortunately, when there was a heavy rain, ground lead levels would come up and we'd see lead toxicosis that way. Um, especially if there's areas where people like to use lead shot to hunt, you will see, unfortunately, the same thing. Um, in the city, I find um, it's a mix of, I'm chewing on things I'm not supposed to. We've had some zinc toxicosis come through for some birds that have been chewing on screws, like dismantling mm -hmm. their... No, I can't tell a parrot not to be a parrot, okay? I don't want it in my house if, I, <laughs> if it's not a parrot, but sometimes we can't protect them from the things that they can get injured from. So I would say definitely here... Um, usually um, paint or like um, exposure to things as opposed to in Philly, I just saw it way more commonly. Okay. Um, so it does depend on like where your lead levels are in your state. That's why I put that, uh, the map up. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah. Yeah, out of everywhere in the country, for some reason, Philly, Delaware, and Jersey have the highest wow. level exposure. All right, okay. Um, okay, another good one. Um, um, an animal trainer behaviorist. Lots of my work in the past four years has been with snakes. She has clients who insist on putting pennies in the snake's water dishes. I just read about this too, because they believe it reduces bacteria in the water. Is it dangerous? And we actually just did this, uh, you know, I had a, a client come in. I, I know. So it was the pennies after 1982 yeah, that are yeah. the ones with snakes. So yeah. So is that dangerous? Um, should they advise them not to do that? I probably wouldn't do that um, just because I, in some ways, it's back to that natural thing. Like um, we really want to make sure that the water's clean, which means you should be cleaning the water receptacle often. Um, and I do find, depending if you're dealing with a naturalistic in, um, setup as opposed to one that's adapted for a pet, it's not as cosmetic, but it's clean. Um, okay. Sometimes 
you know, dirt and debris get into water sources. Mm -hmm. And that's the actual problem. And putting a penny in there is not going to make the fungus stop growing. So um, it's actually part of the reason why you have to be careful with aquatic inverts um, and, and aquatics in general. Mm -hmm. um, we do use copper in certain vet veterinary applications to manage mm -hmm. um, parasite control. Um, but this is not one of those things where the trade offs work the benefit to them. Right. And um, the zinc is bad. Zinc is bad. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. Great. Um, let's see. I'm wondering, let's see. This is interesting. So when someone comes to say to AMC for an exotics emergency, are they going to the, go to the ER first and that's okay. Right. Uh, you know, they're trained and then they will kind of filter it out to you guys. So just maybe explain how that works a little bit it would be great. I'll try to mute in between the question asking because I know Sorry about it. Yeah, well, we're going to wrap soon, but yeah. Um, so yeah, so um, the way it works is um, we're here seven days a week. We have, you know, appointments here seven days a week. Um, there are certain days where you just have to be mindful. We're actually seeing sometimes as much of the caseload as the rest of the hospital. The only difference is there's four of us. Wow. Way more can dog you know, veterinarians in this hospital, we are all treat, we are all able to triage exotics though. So um, if we have open appointment availabilities and things like that for an emergency that walks through the door during business hours, when the, the exotic specialists are here, we're seeing it. Um, if we're in the middle of a surgery, however, um, and an emergency walks in, um, we are IVEX accredited institution. That means the ECC clinicians, um, you know, in our emergency department legally, know how to triage our emergency patients. Um, they have resources guides and they're also in constant communication with us. So this is not like a solo venture. Um, you know, largest, uh, world's oldest and largest nonprofit specialty hospital, Exotics has been here all, I want, we're getting to the 50 year point, I wanna say 35 years. So you're not dealing with a community of people here that are one, unsympathetic to the plight and two, untrained. Um, it's, it's a major reason why I find myself being very proud to be here. There is agency and advocacy for our patients through every department, not just our own. Um, overnight, if a patient comes in and we're not in the building, everyone knows how to triage that patient to make sure that they're getting everything they need, fluid therapy, pain medication, oxygen therapy is needed, and then they immediately transfer to our service the next day. Barring extreme circumstances, um, that's usually the case 365. Um, even holidays, there's still a way for us to be able to triage uh, these animals. Um, and we're pretty skilled at it. So not just myself, but the other clinicians in the hospital. Um, so just be mindful, that's how the process works. Um, there's always an exotics clinician tagged to a case, whether it be in person or at least trying to um, make sure that a patient is stabilized if we're not on site at that moment in time. And then they're coming to us the next day. Great. No, that was great information. Um, okay, so we do have a question about um, RHDV2 in rabbits in this area. Where are we? That's a good one. Yeah. It's like girl child. So many good ones. <laughs> yeah. So um, I gave us, I believe it, a rehabber. Um, so National Wildlife Rehabilitation Association, um, I lecture for, um, I, I tend to be very heavy on the reptile friendly end, but we talk about other animals too, because that interface between wildlife and pet life is dissolving worldwide. And this is one of those situations. We were kind of, I want to say, round zero for when this epidemic popped off. And by that, I mean, COVID hit the same time mm -hmm. the Lisi virus hit. So mm -hmm. us exotics that were, we were double, you know, double mass for a couple of reasons. Um, there, there was, I think, I'm not sure if it was Long Island, but there has recently been a report, um, I would say in mm -hmm. our New York City area of this virus being there, the more information we get about it um, in terms of um, how resistant it is in the environment is now we know there doesn't need to be rabbit to rabbit contact. This stuff survives freezing. It's on fomites, hair, you name it, it's there. Um, it's very difficult to get out of the environment. Um, the feds will come and shut a hospital down for seeing rabbits if there was even an exposure. And that has happened in New York City, unfortunately. Um, fortunately, we weren't a hospital that, you know, we were able to triage those things, but we're sending out tests. The good news is we're not having a number of animals come back positive, at least, you know, from my experience here, and I'm here full time. What I will say, though, mm -hmm. is the biggest thing that we do see a lot of that can be easily missed, um, and is also a hepatic emergency, is the torsions. 
So that's another reason for a liver to be bleeding. It's another reason for liver values to be through the roof. And the good news is our hospital is very well trained in triaging blood work very quickly for liver values. And so if you do come to our hospital and we're like, we really need to check the liver values, it's not because we're trying to be asinine. It's really because we're trying to make sure um, we're one, expediting your pet's um, care needs and two, ruling out if there's a surgical or infectious disease public health emergency that we're dealing with. Um, so I am sad to say it's still in the city. Very happy to say that the vaccination process is quite robust, even with um, um, you know our other friends and colleagues who see exotics in practice in the region. So um, number of rabbits that have been vaccinated, thank goodness. And maybe that's why we're not seeing the surge that we would otherwise see, you know, in wildlife where we don't have as much um, ability to just vaccinate them and try to give them the same immunity, um, you know, bonus points that we're able to afford our, our pet friends. Okay, all right. Um, we're gonna stick with rabbits. We have a, just a few more questions. Um, let's see, should I, uh, if my rabbit's temperature is low, should I stabilize before transporting to emergency? Uh, you got to be careful with that. You really do need to bring them into, like, you can wrap them in a blanket and bring them in, but it's not like, again, it's not DIY medicine, it's respond medicine, get them here. Mm -hmm. uh, reason for the low might be outside of the control of what you could do in the house. And um, just so we can put some science out there, those of you know me, evidence-based mm -hmm. to the very end, uh, my friend who's now up at Cornell, Hey, Nikki. Um, Nikki did um, a study where he just looked at all factors and survival odds um, for animals that had a low rabbits that had a low body temperature. Um, and the odds of death is pretty high if it's not addressed immediately and by immediately by a clinician who can figure out why the body temperature is so low. Okay. Those are the reasons. Um, and, and there's not many that we can figure out at home. Um, and so uh, we get very concerned about low body temperatures. These guys don't have uh, hyperthermia is usually a concern. They don't have the ability to dissipate heat anywhere other than their ears. So um, when they're losing core body temperature, we're, we're very, very concerned. And, and that's usually like a legit like doctor emergency type of a thing. Okay. All right. A um, couple of bird questions. Um, is it necessary to do bottled or filtered water for for birds versus tap? That's a really good question. I would say for New York City, like the city kind of gloats about how healthy their water is. And I was just like, yeah, that depends on if there's any lead pipes in your building. So mm -hmm. that's the historic city in my mind too. I hail from DC, so I know history. <laughs> I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I live in old cities. Um, so I I get filter water and then I do Repti Safe for my pets. Um, but I would say of most of the cities, definitely in comparison to the other Northeast and cities, most people feel pretty comfortable with tap. Um, I just tell people to test their water every now and then, especially if they're in older buildings, might not be that much of a concern if you live in a, in a newer building. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, sticking with birds, uh, we have, thank you, Dr. Latney for saving my love bird cutie, who is doing great. Um, question, I bought a pet safe bug spray, quote unquote pet speech safe bug spray that smells like citronella. Do you know if these are safe for birds? The smell is really strong. Yeah, so it's an aerosol. It's automatically not okay for a bird. Even if it smells like it claims not to be, like anything can be noxious for them. I know it's frustrating. Um, there might be some other uh, innovative ways to manage pests without exposing um, your bird to harm. Um, I make these little, I do it to actually get any fungal nets from my plants, but I make these little things. They're really good at catching flies. I'll send it to put in the link, but it's basically a jar of Dawn dishwashing liquid, some vinegar, and then the rest is water. Um, I put some plastic wrap over it. And then um, I put like a little, um, it's like a plant sticky trap. It looks like a little flower. And that actually attracts a number of the flies and things to it. And then they go into the water and it's a quick humane passing for the bug. Um, that's probably the most effective way I've been able to deal with uh, fungal gnats, fruit flies, the things that are just irritating that are like flighted in your, your home as a pest. Um, roaches are very frustrating. Water bugs are very frustrating. Um, if you are going to use baits, make sure they're behind counters and behind places where your pets will, all pets would never have access. Um, this is going to sound crazy, but I mean it to my core. If you see a couple of centipedes, like the little wispy things that we see in the city, understand that they eat roaches. So they're out here fighting a good fight. <laughs> if you see uh -huh. one of 
They look really creepy. They usually don't want to interfere with you and your pet. Maybe give them a pass. If you see a bunch, I could cause for alarm, but just know they tend to come out when the environment's really humid. So after a heavy rain, roaches are like, let's get it on. And then like the centipedes are like, we're here for natural pest control reasons. They're usually out of sight unless there's a burden they need to clean up. So in that way, it's a bug we want to keep around. All right. Oh, that's good. Ladybugs too. If you don't have insect eating bugs, uh, insect eating um, animals in your house, ladybugs are a really good way to, like a few of them, they'll take care of any aphids and things like that, that could otherwise um, go after your plants and then replicate and start to cause you a nuisance. Okay, great. Um, we have a question, um, kind of general, um, does AMC, do we provide some protocol of information about the things discussed? Um, to provide like, basic information, I guess, for new exotics owners. We do, we have those guide sheets. Yeah, which we have those, I think, in our pet health library. We can send, we'll send people those links yeah. tomorrow. But um, okay, we have a guinea pig question. And then let's see, um, is there any way to tell, uh, tell if your guinea pig has a URI versus is allergic to something like irritated respiratory system from dusty litter, et cetera? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, sometimes I find it's an air quality or a dust quality thing. More often than not, we will see rhinitis or um, sinusitis secondary to just the, the dryness of the air in the environment. I'm guilty of this. It's the other reason why I have plants. They start drooping when the AC is up or when the radiator is turned on. So I can't avoid the seasons. They start drooping. I'm like, that's why I I feel congested, you know, they yeah. kind of give me an idea of ambient humidity. Mm -hmm. I usually find that they have more alert, like more irritation related sinusitis problems associated with humidity, as opposed to dust related things for food. I tell owners one quick way to try to figure that out is while the guinea pig is not there, put the, the, um, the, the hay source down and don't drown it but mist it a little bit just to wait for the dust to like to kind of settle a little bit and if there's a lot of sneezing if there's a lot going on then it might just be like a particulate hypersensitivity more often than not though I can give you 20 things that can cause respiratory disease in the guinea pig and we have one in the hospital right now with it so and those things you're not going to be able to figure out at home but at least that one quick thing checking the ambient humidity and making sure that the dust is not like rampant also if you see the sneezing and, and um irritation away from the food source then then something's not quite right all right great all right all right so i think we will wrap up now this was wonderful and please can we do another one soon with you you were you know fantastic and there's just so much ground to, to cover um thank you everyone I and mean, thank you dr latney for your time um this was just so informative and just far-reaching and i know we could go all night but we won't um but thank you to everyone for tuning in and again we'll send out a link tomorrow as well as um you know, resource information, resource sheets. Um, and just a reminder, our next event is uh, Thursday, November 10th, um, Vision Loss with uh, Dr. Alexander Vandewart. And we'll have that information on our website. And thank you everyone for having, you know, for joining us tonight and have a great evening and we'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.